Before we start this podcast, I want to definitely remind you of a sponsor for Fresh of the Word, 20 by 20 Apparel. Founded in 2015, 20 by 20 Apparel brings original tributes to pro wrestling's classic arenas, moments, and events. They look to spotlight the bloopers, bleeps, and body slams, along with the biggest, smallest, strangest, and strongest. In the world of wrestling, where there's hundreds of shirts, promotions, flyers, social media accounts, and ads, don't get lost in the sea of parody shirts and display fonts. They can provide professional graphic design services at a reasonable price. 20x20 20 20 also hand screen prints all the tees in-house. So if you'd like to discuss a possible run of tees, posters, koozies, foam fingers, or even Zubaz, then drop them a line at 20x20apparel.com. That's the number 20x, the number 20apparel.com. And also check out their enamel pin line. It's super cool. Fresh is the word. I'm Jim Duggan, got long wood for plenty hoes. I keep it fresher than fresh, but you already know. You suckers bum me, I'm money, I got a ton of flows. My weed loud like a motherfucking thunder roll. Your shit quiet like you ballin' on a budget though. We see your kicks and we laugh and yell at one of those. You see me shining like a suit on puppy. You know my grind and shit is too strong, buddy. That's why the dude call money. I be stuntin' like it's nothing at all. Cause it's nothing to me, it's probably something to y'all. Trying to smoke like me, then come and fuck with your dog. Got a closet full of kids, you can't cop it tomorrow. And I'm fresher than the freshest, you can tell it's in my essence. Bitch, you see the way I'm rapping? Yes, I do this shit to death. I tell I'm running out of breath. I tell somebody cut a check. But either way, you know it's fresh. But either way, you know it's fresh. Fresh. We fresh. 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 God damn it, we fresh. Welcome to the Fresh of the Word podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier. And this is episode 187. And the guest for this episode is Christina Steens Stewart, the St. Louis based Eisner, Dwayne McDuffie award winning cartoonist, comics editor, and educator, and co creator of the graphic novel Archival Quality. She also contributed to the music themed horror anthology Deadbeats, recently released via A Wave Blue World. Steens shared her experience going to see the K-pop group twice live in Chicago, which I was so jealous of, which turned into more talk about our favorite K-pop groups, along with all the other great music we listen to. She also shared her experience teaching comics and all the transferable skills that it actually has to other jobs and careers, along with diversity in all aspects of comic creation and the community. Currently, she's offering her consultation and evaluation services to comic artists and writers. Just head over to her Twitter account, which is at OheySteez, for for more information. More information for all of that will be in the show notes for this episode at FreshThePodcast.com. So without further ado, let's get on to this interview with Steens. Okay, I was super jealous that you uh, got to go see twice. Oh my god! Please tell me it, everything. <laughs> it was fan fucking tastic. So first of all, before we even got the tickets, I found out where they were going to be playing, and so I looked online to see where the best seats would be. And I always do that for K-pop concerts, just because it's super important to get like a really good spot so that you can see them dancing. Yeah. You know. So I, I figured out exactly where we needed to be, what section, and then. Both me and my husband were both on um, Ticketmaster the day it went up. I'm, like, at Comic Palooza, like, trying to, like, sell shit. And people are, like, talking to me. And I'm, like, hold on. <laughs> I need to get these fucking K-pop tickets. <laughs> and so... Come back in, like, half hour, please. <laughs> exactly. Like, I'm trying to get these K-pop tickets. <laughs> so eventually he got them and got them in a really great spot right where we needed to be. And then, well, when we got there, there was just like a ton of people congregating outside of the actual uh, venue. And so we were about to get food and we were like, should we go over there? Like, we don't want to like miss out on merch. Right. But found out people were just standing around waiting for the doors to be open. So merch was <laughs> readily ava- available. And I'm glad that we had ordered our light sticks ahead of time because those sold out almost immediately. Okay. Um, and then we got our stuff. 
we were kind of standing in like a clump because there was like no line management at this venue. And so I told Key, I was like, you stay here. I'm going to go around to see if there's a faster way to get in. And there was, and I called him. I was like, follow me. There's a much easier way to get in. So we got in, we got our seats, I got a beer, and it was just incredible from beginning to end. It's like really sad that Mina wasn't there because Mina is like taking like a mental health like hiatus at the yeah. moment. Um, so, but it was still cool to see that they like left a space for her and they kept saying like, you know, come back and see us, uh, you know, when we're a group of nine again, cause you know, that's really, really important. But even though Mina wasn't there, it was still like an incredible, um, concert. They played like obviously all the hits, but they also did some really good deep cuts. Like they, one of the encores was Signal, which like no one likes, <laughs> but like has definitely grown on me because my husband is like the biggest supporter of signal I've ever met. And he was like, that's my Hail Mary. Like they're never going to play it. And so I'm like looking online to see like what the line is like, what the merch is like. And someone on there was like, I heard signal was going to be the encore. So I didn't tell him at all. I was just like, Oh, oh. yeah, maybe they'll play it. Who knows? <laughs> what was his reaction? Oh my God. He like freaked the fuck out. He was like, Holy shit. They did all the songs they wanted them to play. Uh, another one they wanted, he wanted them to play was Ooh La. It was great. I mean, it was it was awesome. It's just, there's one thing I love about going to K-pop concerts. And, you know, we've been to KCON LA and we've been to Red Velvet and I've been to BTS and he, and we both went to, to Twice. And other than like the light sticks, which are obviously one of the coolest parts of k-pop concerts yeah. you know everybody knows the dances you know so i'm like sitting next to people who are like just as much of a super fan as i am yeah. and it's like really really cool to to see you know um kia was saying that there was a, a couple behind us when we were walking back to the train station who was like i like the one in the the bob and what was her name mimi mama and then me and him were like oh my god these locals they have no idea <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, you know, it was it was really, really great. I'm really glad we got to see him. So my yeah. next goal is to see BTS with Kia this time. Okay. And then also to see EXO. But Dio yeah. and Schumann from the group are in the Army at the moment. Because, you know, when you turn 28, you have to do your service. Okay. So yeah. they're currently doing their service. So I'm hoping that when they're finished with their service, they'll come back. And it'll be incredible, and we'll get to see like you know a U.S. concert one day. My fingers are crossed. <laughs> Man, I still haven't I still haven't been to any K-pop concerts, and I really want to. It's so good, dude. I mean, just like the community is so obsessed that like yes, I know <laughs> feel, you can feel the energy in the concert hall, you know. That is crazy. That is nuts. I'm, so, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go. I, 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 I saw there's someone else that went to that concert too that I know, and I'm just like, wait a minute, how did I miss this? I, oh god, I, I'm, oh crap. <laughs> I know, I know. And then like these tickets, they go so fast. I mean, that's yeah. why we were, like camping like the entire day on Ticketmaster, but like <clears throat> they're also super expensive, you know, like. We decided relatively last minute that we were going to go to KCON LA, uh, and we were fortunate enough that we had just gotten married, so we had like an influx of cash. <laughs> right. But we spent like fifteen hundred dollars on like the plane tickets, the uh, the tickets to the show, the tickets to the convention. I mean, all together, it was a lot of money. But then, like just this, which is in Chicago, it's only like a five hour drive from St. Louis that still costs us like $600 because those tickets were like $300, you know? So, yeah, I, I remember when I was looking up uh, tickets, when, um, when BTS did that tour and mm -hmm. they were doing like three nights in London, Ontario and stuff like that. And I saw the ticket prices. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, when I saw them, I definitely got like nosebleed seats for sure. <laughs> but like, it was super last minute. And I was already in New York for um, New York Comic Con. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take a fucking night and go see BTS out 
at City Field. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it was still obviously super, super worth it. But I would love to, to go again, and this time, like, closer, where I don't have to use, like, fucking binoculars, you know? <laughs> what other what other types of music are you in, too? Uh, so, my, actually, my favorite band is Coheed and Cambria. Okay, sweet. So, I'm, like, really into, like, new metal. I guess it's considered, like... New metal, really metal core, stuff metal. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Metal, it's yeah. kind of hard to, to place where they are, but I've been a fan of them for a really long time, and I've seen them like got at least you know six, seven times in concert. I, I love them so so much. I've got like a Coheed tattoo. I like anytime I go to New York or San Diego Comic Con, I always go to uh, their booth and buy new T-shirts and new pins and. I met up. Uh, I met uh, Claudio actually finally for the first time um, at San Diego this year. So okay, nice. It was awesome. Very very chill, you know. But overall, like, Coheed is like my number one. Um, what else do I like? I mean, I also like sadcore music. Okay. So like, so like Mitski and <laughs> yeah. Um, like Lana Del Rey, like stuff that you put on when you just want to like lay in your bedroom and like sing to yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm big into to, to, to that. Um, lately I've been listening to trying to get like more new stuff because I think it was like maybe five years ago I read this article that was like, by the time you hit 30, you don't listen to any new music. And I'm like, fuck that. Yeah, that's same here. Fuck that. Me. Right. <laughs> that is not going to be, that's never me. And that's yeah. never going to be. I'm going to be the 80 year old, like, li- listening to whatever the kids are listening to. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, whatever. Well, if, if I like it. But I, I'll probably like something out of that. You know, there'll be some sort of, like, like you know, depressing or hardcore or something when I'm 80 yeah. years old that's going to rock. And I'm like, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've been listening to, like, uh, TWRP um, or Twerp or Tupperware Remix Party, however you want to say it. Um, Kim Petras. Uh, yeah, yeah. Starcadian. Lizzo, obviously. Oh my God. I'm like seeing Lizzo in concert in October as well. I'm super ready to just like have my skin moisturized and my crops fed. You know, it's going to be incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, there's some cool stuff coming out these days. Um, yeah. but there was something that I'm just like totally into. Wait, what's the, some of the stuff that I'm totally into that's um that you might dig? I'm looking at my I made I made a uh, I constantly keep up with this uh with a Spotify playlist that I made mm-hmm. for the podcast and I just put everything that I kind of like just dig and everything, and I listen. I actually listen to it myself constantly because I'm, yeah. I'm like, oh my god, I made a really good playlist that I can listen to all yeah. the time. <laughs> so I'm like, like, um, I think you, dude. There's this song by Brooke Candy and Charlie XCX and Malibu Meach. It's called XXXTC. I, it's so good. <laughs> Uh, okay, and it's by Charlie XCX. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm sure it is great, because Charlie XCX is amazing. I'll, I have the song here, so I'll listen to it when I'm done with this podcast. <laughs> yeah, dude, that, yeah, that stuff is that's good. I like that. And uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's stuff like that. And um, have you heard, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've, uh, have you heard uh, Megan the Stallion? Yeah. Yeah, I like her, too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's also good. So her, her videos are great. So yeah, I think like that whole idea that like you just stop listening to new music after thirty, like let's kill that idea. No oh, way, we're gonna yeah. continue to listen to new shit. <laughs> I think sometimes, and I think that that also that's with a previous generation. Mm-hmm. I feel like this newer generation, people are um, they're starting families or having kids at different times. Yeah. Um, like the current younger generation, they're like, yo, I, I'm too broke to uh, start a family right now. So blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Though, you know, so they're going to, I think there's going to be a change in the way like that sort of age in regards to listening to music or just even consuming art in general is going to, is, is continually changing just because of 
the economics of the situation and when people are starting families or careers or whatnot these days. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I think it's just like people are just, you know, spending more time on things that, you know, matter to them, I guess. Um, and less of things that they're supposed to quote unquote be doing, you know? Right. And I think before it, it used to go in this weird wave where it's just like maybe in your twenties and your thirties, you know, that's when you were like married and, and having your kids and, and teaching and, you know, watching your kids as they grow up. And then back then while you're in your forties and your fifties, Sometimes you go back to the stuff that you were doing before you had kids. Right. And, and sometimes you have a little bit more income than you had before. So right. you're like, you see like these 40 and 50 year olds like jamming out hard at an LL Cool J concert. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like now they have the fucking time, you know? I'm like, I got the time now. I loved freaking, I don't know, whoever when I was, I loved Slayer when I was, you know, 22 years old. Like, Let's go now, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's like I was at um, Red Velvet and like I saw this like super old dude with like this really young girl. And uh, obviously he was like her dad. And um, I was like, oh, my gosh, she like took her dad to a Red Velvet concert. And then like he takes off his jacket and he's got like, you know, a Red Velvet T-shirt. He's got his own light stick. He's like fucking ready. So I'm like, this is great. <laughs> you know, I want to see more of that. And I think and I think that's a, another change that is like seeing stuff like that. Like I remember when I was a kid, it, like, you know, I'm sure teenagers are uh you know, uh, embarrassed by their parents still, but sure. you see that last where they're like, I, f I feel like, you know, you see that last where, a, you know, uh, a parent and their kid will be at a show and it'd be just like, Oh, all right, we're here. Yeah, absolutely. And not trying to, you know, not feeling, and the kid's not feeling embarrassed to be there. Right. I think that just like, I think people understand that more where it's just like, it's a different world, different things, whatever. Oh, another thing that uh, you know you were talking about on online was that you, you're um, you have an opportunity to uh, teach comics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, talk so, about that. Yeah. Um. So I actually, before all of this, I had started a program called Comics University. And I started when I was working at the comic shop and every Wednesday I would uh, bring in a volunteer or professor to talk about something that has to do with comics. And we talked about a wide variety of things. I'm talking like past women in comics. We're talking like mythology. We're talking movies. We're talking anime. We're talking, um, you know, uh, memoirs versus autobiographies, how to actually put together a book, like actual production. And um, so, like, I, I've been doing that program every summer for the past uh, seven years. And um, every single year we get, like, a ton of students in that just want to learn more about the industry and how to get into the industry. And I'm, like, really uh, focused on making sure that there's something for people who – um, you know, can't afford to go to school for comics, you know, they still get a little something, you know, cause it's a free program. Right. Um, but after I was doing that, um, another, uh, colleague of mine reached out to me and said that he was looking for someone to teach one of his cartooning classes. And I was like, yeah, totally. I mean, like, I don't have like a teaching license. And he was like, well, you know, when you're an adjunct professor, as long as you have the, you know, the experience to back it up, you know, like a, a teaching license isn't actually necessary. And so I was like, okay, well then sign me the fuck up. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I actually went over there uh, yesterday to like take a look at the classroom and get the syllabus and look at the book that we will be working from. So it's nice because I'll be able to, you know, 
follow the syllabus as it has been done in the past few years, but I can also kind of put my own spin on it. You know, it's like as long as we get this sort of information out of it, it's a very, um, you know, sketchbook heavy class. So not so much homework, uh, just definitely more so like working with your peers and figuring out like different ways to look at cartooning. Um, For example, one of the first classes we'll be doing um, is on uh, drawing quickly and getting the idea of something across. So like I would have them draw like a telephone in like 15 minutes, but then I'd have them do it in 10 minutes and then five minutes and then one minute and then uh, you know, 30 seconds, 15 seconds. And so then you kind of take a look at it and see, well, what's most important about this and figure out, well, what's most important to you about this? And then especially if you do it for like a self-portrait, then you can kind of see like, what features do you think are the most exemplary of what you look like so that when you do cartooning of yourself, you can, you know, branch out and make it more stylistic because you have the basics down, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that, that we'll be going over and I'll be talking about. So it should be really fun because, you know, I've been doing different versions of teaching for so many years, you know, with Comics U for the past seven years, but I also do like workshops for different places. I'm going to be doing a workshop for like younger kids in September at like the Magic House here in St. Louis. And then I'm going to be doing, um, you know, consultation and mentorship at FlameCon this year as well. So it's definitely in my wheelhouse to um, get the comics community growing. And that usually means starting with the people that need it the most. You know, I mean, when I was in school for art, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Like, I knew that I wanted to do the general quote unquote art, but I didn't know specifically what that materialized as. And because my professors... I mean, they were all great. Great. I learned a lot from them, of course. But, you know, we didn't have people come into classes and say, like, this is what I do. I'm a storyboard artist. This is what I do. I'm a comic artist or, you know, I do book covers. I mean, there are so many different things that you can do with cartooning and illustration as your background. But when I was in school, I was never told that. And so I just felt like I was kind of floundering for so long because I didn't really want to do children's book illustration, but that's kind of was like the only thing that I was being led toward in my style. And so eventually I was just like paying out of the ass for it because it's fucking college, you know? And I'm just like, you know what? I can't afford this. I don't feel like I'm getting where I need to go. I'm just gonna drop out and get into like the workforce, you know? So eventually I ended up working at the the comic shop, which led me to a lot of great opportunities. Um, But, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do until I I started actually being in a comic shop and seeing people's names on comics and realizing, oh, that's something that I can do too, you know? And so I want to make sure that I kind of pay it forward in a way and make sure that I am as visible as possible to people who aren't sure about what they want to do with their art. You know, like I've done so many different things. Like my art has let me, you know, be like, um, into comics and it it helped me get my comics job and my comics job gave me the opportunity to do event planning and that helped me get my job as a librarian. And so as I was a librarian, I was, Uh, expanding on their graphic novel memoir collection and giving them a zine library. And then from all of that, I ended up working at a publisher. So it's like it all leads to something, but you kind of really need like that one spark of interest. Like, what can I do with this? And so I'm really excited to be able to do that sort of thing in the form of, you know, cartooning. And then those students are going to have a really excellent um, opportunity to hear from an actual working artist. You know, so many times you get teachers who have just been doing teaching and that's it and nothing of their own. And I really like the idea of showing what you're also doing as a professor. You know, I'm working on two separate pitches at the moment. And so while I'm working on my pages for my pitch packet to be sending off to publishers, I'm also going to be teaching. So showing them that like, this is the kind of stuff that you'd be doing if you wanted to go in this direction. This is the kind of feedback that you get as an adult creator. And, you know, it's, I think it's just going to be really helpful for those students. And also for me as well, because I'm going to feel really, um, satisfied with being able to put that out there into the world, you know? Right, right. 
so much to unpack there. Oh my god! Like I have, I have so many questions now after all that. <laughs> so, um, the first thing I want to you know talk about is that whether it's the you know the lesson about drawing quickly or anything else in the in the the class plans or anything that you're in the workshops. What are some things that are just sort of universally transferable that you get out of learning to make comics or cartoons or whatnot? You know, what do you, you know, what skills do you feel like can be transferable to like any other sort of artistic avenue or just any other job in general? Yeah. Um, so I think that one of them is definitely, uh, when you work in comics, you have to read a lot of comics. And that is so that you get better at your craft. You can see what other people are doing. And having that knowledge is good for if you want to. Um, so like say if when I got my job at the comic shop, my knowledge of comics helped me with that. And I had a knowledge of comics because I was drawing, you know. Or when I got my job at the library, my knowledge of comics helped me with that too because they wanted to expand on their graphic novel memoir section. And I have a huge knowledge of graphic novel memoirs. It's like one of my favorite genres. So I think honestly, like reading and having an understanding of the comics landscape further than just single issue comics can help in a lot of different ways. I think you just have to be creative about how you put that on your resume and, and figure out what you want to do with it though. You know, um, you know, I think about like being, um, you know, a, a, a book cover designer, that's something that you need to learn like all the basics for, you know, you need to know color theory, you need to know graphic design, you need to know figure drawing, um, all of those basics that you learn in school are easily transferable to an actual art, focused job like book cover design but that wasn't ever something that I knew that could be done you know it makes sense like I knew people did book covers but I guess it never really like translated to me like oh they did book covers because they went to school for art and they used that for that you know um or like a, a friend of mine she's um an editor uh at a junior library guild and so her knowledge of what's in the market, what's working, what's not working, helps when trying to figure out which books do they want to put in their catalog to offer to librarians, you know? And so how does she have that background of reading a lot of comics? Because she's into art, you know? So honestly, I think one of the biggest things that you can say that you have is a knowledge of the entire comics medium. It's so worthwhile for a lot of different jobs. I think it just depends on how you how you use that to, to get the kind of job that you're looking for. And also you were talking about when you were starting to go to school that you didn't, you know, know what you wanted to do with it and that mm -hmm. there's so many different facets of comic books that people could have a job in doing. So, mm -hmm. you know, what do you suggest that anybody, you know, getting into the comic book industry does to, first off, see what jobs actually exist out there and then which ones are the best for them? So I think, honestly, the, the best way to start is kind of up to the professors of the school. You know, they need to start bringing in working artists of different varieties to show students which avenues they can take first. Because if they don't do that, the students are just going to think, well, I need to be a gallery artist, you know, because I only know how to paint or illustrate or, you know, do printmaking. It's like not only do you have to teach the fundamentals, you also have to teach the execution. You know, you have to show people what can you do with this as a job, you know, and I think once you have that knowledge and you can see there are different avenues for you to take, then that's when you start thinking about, well, how do I need to go into that direction? Who do I need to talk to? 
where in my community can I get more information on this? But if you don't know, you don't know. So the first thing is to make sure that you have a good knowledge of what your options are. And that's not up to you as a student. Honestly, I think it's up to the professors who are the ones that are trying to, you know, lead, you know, new creators. When you're, you know, when you're talking to any sort of any people that are, you know, looking to, you know, start to become an artist or have been doing art and want to break into the industry more, you know, mm-hmm. what's, uh, you know, what is, what is your personal advice, you know, outside of the classroom and outside mm-hmm. of like um, any sort of, you know, if there has ha- if they have any other classes that they're doing outside of anything that you're doing, what's sort yeah. of your advice to sort of you know, guide them in a way to, uh, to, to where they might be able to at least spark an interest in a, Mm -hmm. you know, in an avenue to go towards? Uh, so I think the first thing you do is go online, you know, you need to find out what other people like you are doing. Um, you know, go get a Twitter account, get an Instagram account, look at those tags, figure out what are people doing and how are they doing it and where in the community can you get there yourself? You know, it, it, sometimes it'll take a while, but eventually you'll find something. You know, when I first started um, working at the comic shop, one of my coworkers suggested that I go to this ink and drink meetup. He saw that I was interested in drawing and he was like, oh, well, then you should go and talk to these people because these guys, they all work together to create comics. And I was like, well, this is mind blowing. I had no idea that there was available here in St. Louis, you know, <laughs> so it's not really something that you can just no, you do have to like talk to people and that kind of comes out of conversation once you like have that common interest. Um, and then once you go to these kinds of meetups, that's where relationships start. Yeah. You know, like I pretty much everyone that was in ink and drink, I have had come do classes for my comics university class or I've worked with them in some sort of way that led me to where I am today. So I think it all starts from finding your team, finding your people and figuring out where you want to go from there. And that kind of thing doesn't have to be in a classroom. You know, that could, I, I didn't find them in a classroom. You know, I find up, found them just through, you know, figuring out, well, where are all the artists, you know? So if, if you're uh, into art and you're not in school anymore and you want to know, like, what more can I do? I say, first thing, go to, like, your local comic book store or go to your local art supply store and figure out where are people meeting up to, like, do art, talk art. Find out if there are Facebook groups that you can join. Find out if there are, like, meetups on Instagram that you can kind of figure out. You know, you do have to put in a little bit of work to find those people first, but once you find them, then it just kind of goes from there pretty simple. Outside of that sort of ink and drink community that you uh, found, who who are some of the people, whether it was in person or online, that that you saw and you were like, I want to do something like they're doing or there's, you know, they're doing something that I'm kind of interested in and you were Mm -hmm. able to sort of learn something from those people. Yeah. So I would guess the first person would be uh, Brittany Williams. She did the art on um, Hellcat with Kate Leth. Um, she also did the art on, um, gosh, what was that series? The like, detective series? Uh, shit. All right, I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, first time I saw her, I was on Tumblr, and I was looking at artists, and she was doing this uh, – illustration of Daily Planet um, employees. So, you know, Clark Kent, Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, yeah. all them. And it looked incredible. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to be able to do that. I want to, like, draw comics in my own style and have people, like, support that. And so I never actually had the opportunity to, like, reach out to her. But when I did finally meet her, it was like, a revelation because it was like I had just been trying on my own to be able to get to her level without having talking to her and so eventually when I did talk to her I was like I should have just reached out to her because 
she was just like everybody else, you right. know? Right, right. Um, and I, I think realizing that she was just like everybody else got me more open to start talking to other creators as well. You know, um, I find that a lot of creators are willing to have that talk with you. You know, um, I know if anyone emails me or DMs me, I'm like, yeah, I can tell you a little bit about what I know. Um, you know, obviously you want to take up a ton of their time, but, you know, treating other creators that you want to be like, like peers is really a really great first step. So I found a lot of that through Twitter, through Instagram, through Tumblr, and that's just kind of how I ended up meeting a lot of my uh, comic artist peers was through the internet like that. Um, other than that, there are definitely times when like, okay, so I was in another group. It was um, a group for non-binary and women comic creators. And someone in that group was like, I'm looking for someone in St. Louis who can help do a portfolio review at the class that I'm teaching. And I was like, well, I'm in St. Louis. I've done portfolio reviews. Let me go do that. And I ended up meeting this professor of comics. Her name was Shreyas. And I was like, holy shit, like, you're doing it. You know, you're, like, teaching comics. That's so cool. And so eventually we, like, became friends and we started talking more. And, like, you know, eventually, you know, I'm, I'm now teaching comics as well. But I think... All of that started with me being open to creating these new relationships with people and not feeling nervous to talk to people, not feeling like, oh, they don't have the time for me, you know, because just being yourself and constantly putting your work out there, I think that sort of thing just happens, you know, if you're personable enough people will just want to talk to you and you'll want to talk to other people and just you know you just have to create those friendships and I, I honestly I think online has helped me the most is you know talking to those people on Twitter on Tumblr on Instagram um that's where it definitely started for me do you have any advice for for people going through those steps who might you know just be scared to talk with other people um, people that are, you know, introverted and maybe just a little, you know, sheltered or, you know, they are just, just, you know, shy, you know, any advice? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the biggest advice I can give is the knowledge that everybody, or there's a lot of people that are just as introverted and just as shy. And sometimes they're just waiting for someone to say something to them, you know? So maybe them holding back like is causing another artist to hold back as well you know right. i mean that's one of the things that i always talk about is that the comics community needs to stay a community and not a competition you know you're not at odds with each other you know you you work together to create a stronger community and that comes from being open and being able to talk to people you know you don't have to be on there like 24 7 you know you don't need to like go up there and like do a bunch of shit for the gram I mean it doesn't matter about that I mean as long as you're taking those first few steps to reach out and say like hey I like this a lot I like what you did here or you know this is a really cool idea that you did I'm a fan of it like even stuff like that will get people you know to Start relationships, you know? So baby steps, I guess, would be my advice. Baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> what sort of obstacles have you, you know, gone through during your career um, just, you know, with learning comics or getting through the industry? And how were you able to sort of, you know, get through all of that? Mm, I, think, I think the hardest part was... There are two different ones, actually. So one of them was keep on just continuing, you know, like I wasn't, you know, actively looking to like get into anthologies or anything. I didn't think I was ready. You know, I was just but I did want to keep drawing. And I think not I think seeing other people get into anthologies and get these gigs 
made me wonder like, well, what do I need to do to do that? And I, what I mostly did was just, you know, continue to work at my own pace, you know? And eventually people saw my work and was like, hey, you should do this, this and that. But I think it's hard when you see other people thriving and you're like, well, how come I'm not thriving, you know? But I think if you spend less time thinking about where other people are and more so where you are, it'll be a lot easier, you know? Focus on creating the best work that you can do on your own and things will follow. And then the second thing was, you know, I've been a retailer, I've been a librarian, I've been a, an editor. And I think the hardest part was when I was a retailer and convincing people that, you know, I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> You know, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, I'm a black woman at a comic shop and they're like, I've never seen that. But <laughs> like, also, if I work there, obviously I know what I'm talking about. You right, know, like right. you don't have to be passionate about bread to work at Walmart, but you do need to be passionate about comics to work in a comic shop. Oh, you definitely. know, yeah. Like, how else am I going to be able to help you find what you need? You know, I'm not going to be like, um, I don't know, this one looks cool, give this a try. No, I'm going to be like, <laughs> what do you like to do? You know, are you into like reading about true crime? Well, then you should read My Friend Dahmer. And then once you finish that, read The Green River Killer. And then once you finish that, you know, it's like, I, I want to be able to like tell people what would be a great comic for them to read based on who they are. And you kind of have to have the background in order to do that. And so it was frustrating when, you know, people would ask, like, my male co-workers for help on a certain thing when I could was right there, you know? Right. But thankfully, who I was working with, they are all super, super great. I mean, these are some of the best people I've ever worked with. I still consider them my family, you know? If someone came up and they were like, I need to know about A, B, and C, and they didn't know anything about it, they'd be like, you should ask Steens because she knows, you know? And that alone helped a huge, huge amount when it came to, you know, working there. But I think that was definitely one of the hardest parts of, of getting into the comics community was people on the outside looking in didn't think that, you know, I had the chops or knew what I was talking about. Yeah, like, I know a lot of that stuff is just, you know, in general in our society, but when it comes to comic book stores and stuff like that, like, those... Like, those stigmas, those thoughts still exist. And yeah. it, it was funny, like, um, he, here, in, uh, here in Michigan, here in the Detroit area, uh, there's, um, there's a comic book shop called Vault of Midnight. It has three yeah, locations. Yeah, I love Vault of Midnight. Yeah, they have the Detroit location. And there's, um, there's constantly, you know, you know, black kids, older black men, black families in this... Uh, in this in this comic book store and i remember one time and just it it's so vivid in my mind still i was in there and there was like a group of maybe like five or six you know black kids maybe late teens early 20s and they were talking about they're like man all these years i loved comic books man but i never talked about it because everybody in the hood i thought would you know make fun of me but then i realized my man down the street loved the same shit that i loved and then i realized my man on the other street loved the same stuff too. And then we realized everybody in the hood liked comic books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like all this, all these years, man, I was quiet about it, but there was all these other people that felt the same way and they kept quiet about it too. But it's like, it was super cool to see that. Like there's this whole group of kids that thought that they were, you know, would be made fun of that. They were comic book nerds that found their little tribe of people. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, one of the most frustrating things is when people say like, oh, you know, more women, more people of color are finally getting into comics. It's like, that's not the case. We've always been into comics. You know, I talked to my dad and he tells me that he was reading X-Men when he was younger. He was playing D&D. &D. It's like, we've always been in the nerd sphere, but right. we haven't been in the public nerd sphere. You know, people just, they don't talk about it because they don't think that, you know, people are going to accept it. But 
we've always been here. You know, some of the first people to ever do fan fiction were Star Trek nerds, and they were women. You know, they were sitting at home, they were writing their Star Trek fan fiction and mailing it to each other via snail mail. I mean, if that's not like the sickest shit you've ever heard, I don't know what is. And it's like, it's wild that so many people are like, oh yeah, this, you know, they're like gatekeeping to keep us out. And it's like, yeah, but we were here before you. <laughs> right. You know? I... So like, chill. <laughs> Everybody think... that they say, you know, was never a part of comic books or any sort of geekdom, nerdum. they've always been there. Absolutely. They've always Absolutely. been there. This ain't nothing new. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I think I saw um, uh, a statistic that said that, you know, back in the early 60s, um, the reading demographic of comic books was 55, 45, 55 women, 45 men. And I'm like, hands up in the air, like, hello, <laughs> you know, this isn't new. So I'm just really glad that um, people are more visible now. You know, you have people that are like me, you know, teaching those courses and doing panels and going to schools and showing my face and be like, we're all here and you can come in too. Don't be afraid or don't, you know, stay silent because what you see on TV and in media is that it's only, you know, sweaty white dudes in a basement because that's not the case. You know, what you see on media is not an appropriate representation of the world around us. And I am hoping that that's what, you know, I get, that's what people get from me when they meet me, is they see a more accurate representation of the comics community. Right. And I think with you, you do it so well because I love seeing the the photos that you take and put on uh, your social media and i'm like yo steens has so much style she's looking so beautiful looking so <laughs> cute i'm like how can you not go and talk to her and i bet she's super fun to be around you know i was like yeah. like this is the type of that's the type of people that i let you know like to see you know and and people like you make make comics much more fun and inspiring to people Exactly. You know, and, and thank you. And I, I think that that is something that I've always wanted to do. You know, like I was when I was asked to move from marketing over to editorial, um, you know, at first I was like, no, because I don't like change. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's just who I am. I'm a very anxious person about new things. Um, but, you know, I was talking to my boss, Jeff, about like, why I want, what I want to do with my life and my career. And I said, I want to make it easier for marginalized folks to be a part of the comics community. I want to grow this community in a healthy way so that there are no more gatekeepers, so that more people can um, feel like they belong here. And he was like, you can do that in editorial. In fact, you can do it better in editorial. And I was like, mm, yeah, you're probably right about that. So, okay, I'll take the job. But, like, I think that no matter what I'm doing, as long as I'm doing that, as long as I'm being, like, a spokesperson for, you know, marginalized creators and, um, you know, people who actually represent the comics community, then I'm doing, I'm doing okay. <laughs> well, I think you're doing a great job. I always see people really complimenting your work. You know, that was something that I really noticed that people who have, you know, a pretty good, uh, you know, role in the comic book industry have, you know, definitely been giving you, giving you your props online. So I definitely feel like you are, you know, on a, on a good avenue to make make things better. I do appreciate that. I know that's one thing that, because, you know, I'm not like, no one is perfect, you know, and I think one of the problems that I have is realizing that, you know, I'm still doing okay. You know, I was saying that, you know, I don't like change. <laughs> I don't like new things and it like, you know, new 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 directions and all of that make me nervous. And, when I am going off that track that I think I'm going on, I get in my head, you know? So like, if I'm not doing editorial anymore full time, 
what am I doing? Like, I'm obviously a failure. And it's like, well, no, like, instead of, you know, feeling anxious about um, what I'm doing now, I think I should be more open to thinking, well, how can I continue my goals without, you know, full-time editorial gig? What else can I do? And I'm doing it, you know? And I think just the fact that it's new and different and being freelance is like scary. I think that's where most of my hesitation comes from. And I think that's like a human emotion, you know, is to be that kind of nervous. So I do also hope that, you know, that I can keep on keeping on, <laughs> you know, so that I'm not um, constantly like, I don't know, not really knowing where I'm going. I think it's, it's okay to not really know sometimes. Right. But I got to convince myself of that. <laughs> I think we all go through that and it's, I guess it's uh, part of being a creative person. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, creatives are super critical of themselves. You know, like I look at my artwork, like I look at my, my first book and I'm like, oh my God, I don't even want to look at it anymore. You know? <laughs> but like, also there are other people who are like, this is amazing and I love it. So it's like, on the one hand, okay, cool. Maybe I did something good. But on the other hand, I'm always going to be like, this is shit. <laughs> Right, right, right. But no, I think you're, I think you're uh, amazing and you're on a right, really good path. I feel like you're very inspiring to people. We need more people like you in the, the comic book industry and just in any sort of artistic industry in general. So yeah. thank you. And I always like to end my interviews with the same question and I did uh, give it to you ahead of time to think about it. And that is, who is somebody that you would suggest that I interview for this podcast that might have some good stories or lessons to talk about? Cool. So um, I think uh, Wendy Shu will be really good. That's Wendy, spelled like Wendy Shu, that's X-U. Um, she is doing the book Mooncakes and, from Lion Forge, and she just got another like three-book deal as well. Um, so I think she'll be really interesting to talk to because she definitely comes from a, um, um, a traditional publishing background, but also has the background of people who do web comics. Yeah. And I find that people who do web comics are some of the most ambitious people that I know. And I want to, and I think that Wendy is doing a great job showing people who have done web comics that they can push further. You know, they can get paid a fuck ton of money <laughs> for like actually getting their stuff published and you know talking about what the advantages of publishing are versus self-publishing online you know so I think she would be a, a really good person to, to talk to for sure awesome yeah I, I, I do uh, follow her on on Twitter so that's, that's a definitely great. good suggestion all right, before we get out of here, um, like it, it has been great talking with you. Where can people go online to get more information about what you're working on? And if there's anything you want to plug right now, go right ahead. Cool. So you can find me on Twitter at ohaysteens. That's O-H-E-Y steens, S-T-E-E-N-Z. Um, that on Twitter and that on Instagram. Um, if you follow my Instagram, you'll get stories with my cat, which is also nice. Yes. Um, <laughs> And I want to plug Dead Beats. It is the music horror anthology coming out from Away Blue World yes. um, in October. It is officially, as of right now, available to order at your local comic shop. So go to your local comic shop, order Dead Beats, and you can see my, my and Ivy's uh, six-page horror comic in there. Right. I can't wait to. I can't wait for Dead Beats. I uh, contributed to the to the Kickstarter for that. I, I think it, it looks amazing. So that was my interview with Christina Steens Stewart, and more information about where you can follow her and about her consultation and evaluation services that she's currently offering. Uh, all those links will be in the show notes for this episode at freshthepodcast.com. And just a reminder, I do have two new music-based podcasts that have launched. Breaking Records, that's my all-encompassing 
music podcast with interviews with bands, music artists that I really dig. And then we have the Renaissance Soul podcast, which is my Detroit music history podcast. We touch on specific topics from the past and present from Detroit music. Uh, You can go stream those and subscribe to those on all the major platforms, Breaking Records, Renaissance Soul. If you want more information about those, just go to freshthepodcast.com and you can see the episodes that are already up. But please spread the word on all three of these podcasts. Share, subscribe, rate and review on Apple Podcasts. That definitely help out. So thank you for listening. Goodbye and good night. Fresh is the word.